our district, um, the poorest students are left to the worst schools, which is in every district. I know that's not um, new, but our district particularly is carving out the high achieving niche. And so they have created elitist pockets that school, uh, students from underperforming schools are not really able to, uh, to have access to. 80th percentile or above, you can't have any discipline infractions, you have to have a certain test score. And so what they did is they pulled out to keep them happy, all of those students, leaving the other schools to sort of flounder. We're about uh, 80 to 81 percent minority population, and uh, most of which is African American. And we have, uh, I think, according to our free and reduced lunch counts, we're at 68 uh, percent free or reduced lunch, um, which is a really low income level. Our culture here and our expectations here are completely different from what they encounter at a lot of public schools. Uh, the expectations we have for morality, for ethics, for behavior are really new for a lot of students. Our curriculum certainly makes us unique um, and I think that our expectations, our high expectations make us uh, unique and that's, that's certainly something that I've seen um, in dealing with past performance versus current performance is the change in expectations, the change in, in standards. And we took part in the Barney Foundation's principal training and uh, faculty training uh, up at Hillsdale and they, they absolutely loved it. Um, uh, loved meeting the other people involved uh, out of Dallas and out of uh, New Mexico and obviously Dr. Moore and Phil Kilgore. And then this summer, Hillsdale training was July 14th. Before I even had my feet wet here, I was back up in Hillsdale. And that was exciting uh, because of the, the guidance. So it was all about how to, what a classical school should look like and what procedures and policies should be in place, what you're gonna run into, things like that. Um, and so that was really educational uh, for me. And then Barney uh, also sponsored a two week, extra two weeks of faculty training here in Savannah for all of our faculty, uh, training them on, on teaching rigs, Singapore math, and the core knowledge curriculum um, on top of just the general, again, more of that school culture training, what it should look like, how to deal with situations. We had all met for the first time um, as a faculty like a week before, and we came in and we had, you know, our, our two week intense training. We came in and we had this big binder of things from Hillsdale and um, we had Dr. Moore here and just sitting and hearing about classical education because none of us are, are from a classical education background. Um, we had all done our research and we were a little familiar with it but to hear him talk to us about what a typical classroom should look like and the kinds of things they expected the students to learn, um, that was very insightful because it, it kind of gave us a push into, oh, these are the things we've got to get on top of before the children get here. The second week of school, I gave a quiz, and it was, it was on the continents and the oceans. And almost all 50 of my sixth grade students failed. Um, now, on the, on the quiz that they had today, um, I, I had three Fs out of, out of all those students. Letting them have a real story to read and tear apart and talk about is incredibly rewarding. Um, I had one parent email me and she said, my son has never read before on his own and he just made me buy the 1905 Bullfinch mythology. And so now he has this like entire collection of the Bullfinch myths and, and he's been reading them to himself and, and talking about the myths with his parents and he was not a reader before and so that was really cool to see like, oh, when you expose kids to stories that are actually exciting, um, they really get a chance to enjoy reading for the reasons they're supposed to. Kids love it, and they actually love it K through six. It's most, most easily evident uh, and seen in the lower grades, and hopefully you'll see writing samples from day one to now. And it, you can't even tell it's the same child's handwriting. It's fantastic, and they're learning how to spell things, and you'll, you'll see children, all of a sudden the whole world becomes this puzzle. All these words everywhere, you're learn you, you know these combinations of letters, and all of a sudden you can start to piece these words together and sound them out. And all of a sudden, oh, that's what virtues looks like. It's just, and they just light up. Compassion, perseverance, compassion, perseverance, responsibility, responsibility, respect, 
think it's the best curriculum would be the simple way to put it. I think that it's, it's what best prepares students to be uh, thinkers and innovators instead of, I, don't know, I hate to say it this way, but regurgitators, you know, to, to, to be able to, to think and to apply that knowledge and to learn um, the things that matter, things that matter uh, beyond just success in a career, things that matter in life. Because this uh, school has really reached out to students who have, um, have been in underperforming schools, I see it as, um, as vision building, really, for the, for the family, affecting the families as they go home and tell their parents what they're learning. They're beginning to understand that, um, that there's so much more out there in terms of knowledge. The other piece of it for me, and, and, and it's really affected the way that I teach my fifth graders now, um, is the idea of, of this responsibility we have to uphold this great republic we live in and what a good citizen looks like. The biggest lie that everyone tell, says is that if you're poor or if you don't have X, Y, or Z, or if you come from here or there, this neighborhood or that, that you can't learn, that you don't have the ability to do it. And that's just blatantly false. And we're, we're here to prove everyone wrong.